Welcome back to Parking Full Time. I'm Big Dave the Parker. And this is the fifth Bible study and prayer time video in our Titus series for summer and fall of 2022. The goal of Parking Full Time is to display the glory of God's creation by visiting every state park, national park, and national forest in the contiguous 48 states. But the God who created this world is also the God who sent his son, Jesus, to die for our sins, pay the sin payment that we couldn't pay, the death payment we couldn't pay for our sin, and therefore save this world. And that's what these Bible study videos are designed to highlight. A couple of caveats or warnings about this Bible study that I put in here occasionally. Um, first of all, if you're familiar with Bibles, uh, you'll notice that I use the King James Version of the Bible um, for all of these Bible study videos. Uh, there are several reasons for that. <clears throat> um, one of them is that the King James Version is the only relatively recent version of the Bible that is not copyrighted. Uh, I can't take a copy of the NIV, for example, and put it on camera and send it all over the world legally like I'm doing right now. Um, that's a copyright violation. But with the King James, I can't. And so that's one reason. Uh, second uh, caveat about this Bible study, the view I'm going to present here is the conservative independent Baptist point of view on Scripture. And I know that not everybody in the kingdom of God thinks that way, but I think that way. And I am the one doing this Bible study and recording this video, and therefore that's how I'm going to record it. In this video, I want to look at the last part of Titus chapter 2. Uh, we did the first part of Titus chapter 2, the first 10 verses in the previous video in this series. And so therefore, so we're going to start with uh, Titus chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 15, the end of the chapter. And if you've watched these videos before, you know that I like to read the entire text to get a feel for the overall text before we start looking at the details of the contents of the text. And so let's look at Titus chapter 2. Let's read verses 11 through 15. And so Titus chapter 2, starting at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. As I mentioned before, the key phrase in the book of Titus is this phrase here that I boxed from one of our earlier Bible study videos, uh, this phrase, good works. Uh, that phrase appears six times in the book of Titus, and it appears right here at the end of verse 14. And in particular, so it appears in this phrase here where it says, zealous of good works. Uh, those of us who believe in Jesus, we should be zealous of good works or eager to do good works. As I look around at, the, at people today, I think we really need this encouragement today. Uh, in my travels doing hiking videos and disc golf walkabouts and that sort of thing, um, I walk into a lot of different churches while I'm traveling. And I walk into a lot of different churches, and when I do that, I see a lot of Christians who don't really want to do anything, at least not for the Lord. Uh, a lot of people who call themselves Christians, they seem to take the attitude that, well, I'm just happy that I'm saved. Well, I'm happy that I'm saved too, but I don't, I don't want to just be saved. I want God to be happy with the way I'm living. I want to show some other people how they can be saved just like I'm saved. And so God's people should be zealous of good works. And that's the main topic that we're going to study tonight. The encouragement that Paul gives to Titus here to be zealous of good works. And so I have three main points in this text that I want to look at tonight. Uh, the first point about being zealous of good works is the basis for our zeal, and that's up here in verse 11. Okay? Verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The basis for our zeal for good works 
should be the grace of God. And so I'm going to put a box around that phrase here, the grace of God. And I'm going to write up here, that's our basis. That's the basis for our zeal. The basis for our zeal is the grace of God that bringeth salvation. And in particular, the fact that this grace, God's grace, has appeared to all men. You see, God is gracious to everyone. Uh, he does good things for everyone those who believe in him and those who don't. Uh, elsewhere in the Bible, it says he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. A good reference for this is uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. So let me write that in here, and we'll look at that. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, and there's a key thing in that verse that I want to make sure you see. So let me flip back here to Romans, and Romans chapter 5. Uh, Romans chapter 5, right? and look up here at Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And notice what it says here about God's love and God's grace. It says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The important thing in this verse is that he died for us. He did that while we were yet sinners. Uh, when before we knew him, maybe before we were even aware that he existed, he died for us. You see, nobody will ever be able to stand before God and say, God wasn't gracious to me. Uh, nobody will ever be able to stand before God and say, my sin didn't get paid. No, everybody's sin got paid. But you have to believe in him in order to accept that payment. You see, we've all sinned. We've all done things that God has told us not to do and failed to do things that God has told us to do. Um, we have all been, as he says here, sinners. And the Bible says that, that the penalty for that sin is death, eternal separation from God. But it goes on to say that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, through the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's God commending his love toward us, that he chose to die for us, he chose to show us his grace while we were yet sinners. And just thinking about back through my life, um, I didn't believe in Jesus the first time that I heard what I just told you about God's love and God's grace. But in spite of that, he was gracious to me. He still died for me. He still died to pay my sins. Um, he And he gave me another chance. He gave me more chances. And after that chance, he gave me another chance and another chance to believe in him. And when I was 11 years old, as a result of a Sunday school lesson, not all that different from this video, I finally believed in him. Uh, I finally accepted the death payment that he paid for me, the death payment that he paid while I was yet a sinner. So he was gracious to me in giving me all those extra chances, and he did that while I was still a sinner, while I was an unbelieving, unrepentant sinner. And the reason he does that, because he is gracious to everyone. God's grace has appeared to all men. Now, back in Titus, so we see that the basis for our zeal, the basis for our zeal for good works, uh, should be the fact that uh, should be God's grace, the fact that his grace has appeared to all men. Okay. Next up in the next couple of verses, we have the process for our zeal, the process that produces our zeal. And the key word here is at the beginning of verse 12, the key word is teaching. Okay. Teaching is the process that produces our zeal for good works. So I boxed the word teaching there, and then I wrote process beside that. Uh, the word translated teaching here at the beginning of verse 12, it carries the idea of training or instruction. Uh, a zeal for good works doesn't happen automatically. It takes training. It takes effort. It takes practice. 
In particular, verses 12 and 13 here, these next two verses, uh, show us three things that we need to do as part of this training to be zealous of good works. And so three things as part of this teaching. The first one is the next phrase here. The first one is denying ungodliness and, wor and worldly lusts. First thing we need to do to get this training, this process that produces zeal for good works, we need to deny ungodliness. Uh, this denying ungodliness, that's a very general statement, and it means exactly what it sounds like. Uh, stop doing things that are ungodly. Stop doing things that are contrary to God. In the Colossians Bible study that I led last year, um, we I did an entire video on putting off the old man on stopping doing the things, the evil things, that we used to do before we trusted Christ. Um, so I'll write down the reference here. I'm not going to take the time to look at this because, again, I did an entire video on this last year. But Col Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, um, talk about putting off the old man. Uh, they talk about stop stopping doing things that are contrary to God. Uh, they talk about bitterness. Uh, they talk about anger, wrath, clamor, evil speaking, malice, uh, lying, and there are many other things there. Um, but these are ungodly things that we need to deny, that we need to put off. Uh, as I mentioned, I first trusted Jesus 34 years ago. I'm still working on putting these things off. I'm still working on denying ungodliness. But I am working on it. And if you believed in Jesus, you should be able to say the same thing. Uh, you should be able to say that you're working on putting off this ungodliness. Uh, you should notice less bitterness. You should notice less anger. You should notice less evil speaking, lying, and malice in your life now than you did, say, five years ago. And when we see that, when we see less bitterness and less anger and less evil speaking, less lying in our lives than we did five years ago, that is the process of the Holy Spirit teaching us to deny ungodliness. And that's part of the teaching process that produces a zeal that makes us zealous for good works. And that's a really good thing. So first thing it teaches us to do, it teaches us to deny ungodliness um, next thing here is later on in verse 12, it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. That's the second thing that of this teaching process, the second part of this teaching process that produces zeal for good works, living soberly. Uh, the word sober keeps coming up again and again here in Titus chapter 2, and it means to live a sound and responsible life. Um, we saw it several times in the bit that we studied last week. If we go back to the first part of Titus chapter 2, um, the word sober came up over and over again here. In uh, Titus chapter 2, in verse 2, uh, it says that, that the aged men be sober. It tells the aged men to be sober. In verse 4, where it addresses the young women, it says uh, that they may teach the young women to be sober. Same word appears there. In verse 6, where it addresses the young men, it says, uh, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So over and over and over again, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter whether you're old or young. Over and over and over again, it comes up this idea that we need to be sober. We need to live a sound, responsible life that we talked about in the previous video. And so now here in the second part of Titus chapter 2, to this idea of living soberly, so to this idea of living a sound and responsible life, so he says live soberly, righteously, and godly, and then to this idea he adds this critical thing, in this present world, in this present world. You see, the time to live soberly, is now. The time to live righteously is now. The time to live godly is now. The time to live this sound, responsible life that we looked at last time, the time to do that is in this present world. The time to do that is now. 
You see, God's grace has appeared to us now. The Holy Spirit's process of teaching is happening now. And so the time to be zealous of good works is now. It's in this present world. So again, three things that uh, we have in this part of this teaching process uh, that's designed to produce zeal for good works. There's denying ungodliness. Stop doing things that, uh, that maybe we used to do in the past, but we shouldn't be doing because they're ungodly. They're not like God. So denying ungodliness, living soberly. And then the third thing is down in verse 13. At, at the very beginning of verse 13, it says, looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope. Unlike these first two things, where we have denying ungodliness and living soberly, that's in this present world. This phrase here, looking for that blessed hope, and then he expands on that with the next phrase, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This one is not in this present world. This one, looking for that blessed hope, this is forward-looking, looking towards his second coming. Uh, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, that refers to Jesus' second coming, not his first coming when he was born as a, as a baby in a manger, but his second coming that is talked about elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, Jesus himself talked about that. He talked about the need to look for his second coming. I'll write, that, that, I'll write down that reference and we'll look at it here. Um, it's Mark chapter 13, Verses 32 through 37. Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37, where Jesus tells us to do exactly this. He tells us to look for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, to look for his second coming. Let's go and read that. Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. This is the book of Mark, uh, the second gospel, Mark chapter 13. And look at the end of the chapter, verses 32 through 37. And Jesus himself is saying this. He says, but of that day and that hour, again, talking about his second coming, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And then because of that, here's his instructions. He says, take ye heed, pay attention, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. We don't know when he's coming a second time. We know for sure he's coming. He said that he will be coming a second time, but we don't know when. And then verse 34, so four, so because an explanation on this. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants. His servants are us, those of us who have believed in him, and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore. So the logical consequence of this situation, he says, watch ye therefore, um, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, ye don't know when he's coming, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. And here's why we need to watch, lest, suddenly he, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, he find you not watching for him. Not living a godly and righteous life. Not denying ungodliness. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Very last thing he tells us here in this chapter, he says, watch. Watch for him. And so if we love him, we should do what he tells us to do. We should watch for his coming. Back in Titus, so we've talked about the basis for our zeal of good works. And we've talked about the teaching, the process that produces our zeal of good works. Right? Um, finally, uh, down here in uh, verse 14, so lastly we have the motive for our zeal. Right? And the motive for our zeal is at the very beginning of verse 14. Right? And so at the very beginning of verse 14, he says, Who gave himself for us. That's the motive for our zeal. I'm going to write motive in right there. Okay. The motive for our zeal is the fact that he gave himself for us. 
that phrase gave himself that carries the idea of self-sacrifice. You know, I've heard people say out of guilt, you know, I killed Jesus. Or, you know, my sins killed Jesus. Or even worse, they try to guilt trip other people. You killed Jesus with your sin. No, I didn't kill Jesus. You didn't kill Jesus. Nobody killed Jesus. He gave himself. He chose to die for us. He gave himself willingly for us. And the reason he did that, the reason he gave himself willingly for us is in the rest of his, in the rest of this verse. So he gave himself, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. He gave himself for us to pay for our sins, to pay the death payment that we own because we are sinners. Uh, that's one reason he gave himself for us. He also gave himself for us to, and to purify unto himself a peculiar people, to purify us to himself, to remove the death penalty of sin, and therefore separate us for good works. And our response to that here is in verse 15 there, the last verse of this chapter. Uh, verse 15 says, These things speak and exhort, encourage other people to be zealous of good works, and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. Uh, this is what Titus was told to do, and it's what we need to do. For the basis, we need to speak the grace of God, uh, the fact that the grace of God is available to everybody, to anyone who will believe in him. Mainly, that's by giving the gospel. Uh, everybody needs to hear the clearest form of the gospel they can to make the grace of God appear as brightly as possible. Uh, for the process, we need teaching. We need to be teaching, and we need to be taught. We need to be taught to deny ungodliness, to live soberly, to watch for him. We need to be taught that, and we need to teach other people to do that. For the motive, we need to encourage and uh, encourage and exhort people, encourage people to be zealous of good works. Uh, that's what I've tried to do with this video, and really, that's what I've tried to do with this entire series in Titus. Um, this video is really kind of the core of the book of Titus. Uh, if I was trying to cover the book of Titus in just one video instead of seven, like I'm doing, um, this would be that video. The entire point of the book of Titus is that we should be zealous of good works. We should be eager to do things for him, good things for him. Why? Because he gave himself for us. So we need to do these things for each other. We need to encourage each other in these things. And we need to do that on a daily basis. We, as God's people, need to be zealous of good works. That finishes Titus chapter 2. We'll get into Titus chapter 3 next time. I close each of these videos with a brief uh, prayer time, so I'm going to show you my prayer list here. Uh, you can send prayer requests and comments and feedback on this video to parkingfulltime at gmail.com. That's the email address that I use to run this project. I'm not going to guarantee that I'll read every single prayer request that I get there, but uh, I will, and I'll add it to this list if it's appropriate. So a few things I'm praying for right now. Um, so I'm praying for our country and its leaders. Uh, in particular, I'm praying for God's people, that God's people will be zealous of good works. So that's one thing I'm praying for. Um, I'm praying for the furtherance of the gospel and people who preach it. And I'm praying that believers will grow. And to add, this, to, add to that here, based on what we just studied in Titus chapter 2, I'm praying that believers will grow and be zealous of good works. I think that's really important. I think the Bible tells us to do that. So I'm going to take a few minutes and pray for these things now. I encourage you to do the same. And so I'm going to wrap up this video. Until next time, I am Big Dave the Parker for Parking Full Time. Have a great afternoon. Take care. And Lord bless.